Harun al-Rashid was the Amir al-Mu'mineen of the time, he was the head of state for the Muslims. And back then, the head of state's responsibility was also to lead the people in Friday prayer. Because he's a religious figurehead too. Abu Yusuf, he had taken him as his muallim for hajj. And you know how in hajj you have a teacher with you? Who's going to walk you through all the rituals? His teacher was one of the pioneering scholars of the Hanafi school of thought. So he's, he's about to lead Zuhur prayer. And he realized he wants to get cupping done. You know cupping when you draw the blood? So he got that done. So now he's bled. In their position, in his teacher's position, if you bleed, your wudu is broken. So now he's in the front row at the Kaaba, and he's about to lead the prayer, but officially his wudu is broken. And you have to walk through a thousand rows back towards the water, and because he's the head of state, everybody's going to want to say salam. Everybody's going to want to say, hey, can you please make dua for me? Or some, have some request, because he's a VIP. So by the time he goes back there, and calls, comes all the way up, it's going to be Asr time. So he's stuck. Next to Qadi Abu Yusuf, Imam Malik is there. Imam Malik, different school of thought. And in Imam Malik's school, if you bleed, your wudu doesn't break. And Harun al-Rashid knows that. So he, on purpose, asked Imam Malik, Hey, is my wudu okay? I just had cupping done. Imam Malik said, yes, of course it's okay. You can lead. And he led the prayer at the Kaaba. Everybody prayed behind Khalifa Harun al-Rashid. And as soon as the prayer was done, the Hanafi students of Qadi Abu Yusuf come running to the Shaykh. You just let him pray. He didn't have, he bled. How could you? He said, anybody who doubts that prayer is from the Khawarij, meaning the people who left Islam. Why did he say that? Why did he pray behind him? Because he understood something. When the roots are the same, this fruit and this fruit, we can disagree. But to the best of my understanding, this is the best of their understanding. I don't believe this to be the absolute truth. This is, as far as I find, the most convincing argument. The most convincing argument to me is that bleeding breaks wudu. The most convincing argument for Imam Malik is that bleeding does not break wudu. And you know what? Allah knows best. So I'm going to be humble and not say I know the absolute truth. That I have the absolute truth. And I make dua for him. And in fact, if this is what the leader has decided, then I'm going to give benefit of the doubt. I'm not going to tell my followers, you better repeat the prayer. I'm not going to do that. If you do that, then you're no longer Muslims. You've left the religion, al Khawarij, the extremists who left the religion. This is how the early people understood differences. Compare this to how we think about differences. Compare this to how easily we kick someone out of Islam. We drop someone out of Islam. Just because they don't pray, they don't stand the same way we do. You see somebody holding their hands here, you're like, mm. somebody else is holding their hands, you're like, oh my God. And if somebody's holding their hands like this, oh, forget it. You know, <laughs> you know that's the end of it. And if we keep this kind of discourse up, and we make that public discourse constantly, then the, the price will not be paid by us. The price will be paid by us in the afterlife. This world, the price will be paid by the next generation, who will fall into doubt about the religion altogether. That's a guarantee from Allah in the Qur'an. وَإِنَّ الَّذِينَ أُورِثُوا الْكِتَابَ مِنْ بَعْدِهِمْ لَفِي شَكٍّ مِّنْهُ مُرِيبٍ So come back to the fundamentals. آمَنْتُ بِمَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهُ مِنْ كِتَابٍ وَأُمِرْتُ لِأَعْدِلَ بَيْنَكُمْ Come back to the source. I believe in what was sent down from Allah's law, from Allah's book, and I have been commanded to do justice between you. We have our deeds, you have yours. There's no reason to argue between you and ourselves. Allah is the one who will make us united, and to Him we have to go back. Let's not debate this. It's fine, you do what you do, we do what we do. We know our evidence is good enough. This is only going to create fitna. This is only going to create contention. Don't make this the point of contention. And if we can stick to that in the way we teach religion, the way you teach your children prayer is going to be different from other people who teach their children prayer. But if they grow up thinking that those people who pray differently from them are kuffar or are dal and mudil, they're misguided, deviant, corrupt, then you have done a disservice to your children. It nullifies their prayers. It invalidates their prayers. If they become people of tafarruq, May Allah Azza wa Jal make us a people that cause unity between the hearts and not tafarruq. May Allah Azza wa Jal make us committed to the truth and committed to our values. Just last qualification that I want to mention to you, I'm entitled to my opinion. I'm entitled to be convinced of what I'm convinced. I have met with other scholars and I tell them right flat out, I respect you a lot for your work, but this, this thing that you said makes absolutely no sense to me. I think it's utter nonsense, but I'd love for you to explain it to me. But I don't do that in public. I do that in private conversation. And when we're done doing that, we eat together. 
and we go to each other's homes, and that's okay. If I can have that kind of a conversation with a Christian, with a Jew, with an atheist, why can't I have civil conversations with Muslims? Why am I not capable of that? The Ummah has lost its ability to show mutual respect only because of some disagreements. Ikhtilaf has turned into tafarruq. Ikhtilaf is okay, but tafarruq is not.